Hello, everyone. And welcome again uh, to session number two. Today, uh, we have Martha Thome presenting from McGill University. Uh, and she will follow up uh, on uh, yesterday's talk about how OMR is done in Rodan and at the Simsa project. And she will follow up with uh, practical information about how to use Rodan for yourself. I am myself very much looking forward to this because I've been wanting to explore the OMR pipeline by Simsa for a few years now. And uh, it's great that now these resources are, uh, are coming, you know, to us. Uh, so without further ado, Martha, please take it away. Martha, we don't hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yep. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, so um, this is the first workshop. It's making Rodan work for you. So um, this presentation builds upon the presentation you saw yesterday by Professor Ichiro Fujinaga. So in that presentation, you saw the general overview of the OMR workflow and also the overview of the SIMSA technologies we have to do the, this OMR workflow within Rodan. So now you're actually going to see Rodan and going to see these technologies within Rodan. Um, so I'm going to be following this end-to-end -end OMR documentation that we have a, in our website. It's here, it was written by a colleague of mine. It's, it's very comprehensive. Um, so I'm going to be following the sections over here. So uh, starting with with this one. So this documentation is basically about optical music recognition with Rodan. And so this site describes the OMR process implemented at DDMAL for encoding manuscripts in the music encoding initiative format. So you start with an image and you end up with an MEI file encoding the contents of that image. And in particular, we're going to focus on a square notation music. So as it's described here, you have uh, two sections you have this overview section and this OMR tutorial section. So the overview section um, has a, an overview of optical music recognition. So basically what you saw yesterday about the different stages of OMR. Uh, and then it has an overview about Rodan if you're not familiar with Rodan. And then a, an overview of each of these four stages uh, from the Rodan point of view. So from the tools in Rodan that you would be able to use at these particular stages. And then you have a tutorial that goes through all those stages, but to actually process a manuscript. So that's the structure that I'm going to follow today. Um, so right now, the first thing would be uh, to go over the overview. So let's start with the overview of optical music recognition. And uh, this is just a refresher from what you saw yesterday. So optical music recognition has these four main stages, uh, the document analysis stage, the symbol classification, the music reconstruction and encoding, and then uh, the actual correction of the results. So the document analysis stage is where you would go and basically segment your document into layers. So you have your image of a music score and you want to segment it into different layers, the music symbol layer, the staff line layer and the text layer, because each of these layers are going to be processed separately by different process during, during the whole workflow. So after you have separated your document into layers, you go to the symbol classification stage. Here, uh, what you would do is uh, take your music symbol layer and um, basically find each of the symbols and then classify it. Say, okay, this is a clef, it's a C clef, this is an F clef, uh, this is a, if we were in modern notation, this is a quarter node, a half node, and so on. So this is a symbol classification stage. Then you have the music reconstruction and encoding stage. So in this stage, you go back to um, reconstruct the music and have all the semantics back. So you take your symbols recognized here and uh, with the staff line layer, you can identify the pitch by looking at which 
uh, actual staff line they are located or uh, or space in the in the staff. Uh, so you do the pitch finding. Here's where you also add the text if in case you have the text. And at the very end, uh, you have this uh, MEI encoding tool that will give you the MEI, uh, the MEI uh, file encoding the contents of that particular image. So, and here is where you have reconstructed all the semantics of the original piece. Um, and then at the very end, you have the symbol score generation and correction. Uh, for this, we use NEON. You saw a, a few screenshots of NEON the last time. And that's what we use for correcting the results. Uh, so as I said, um, I'm going uh, to move to an overview of Rodan. Instead of going through this uh, text overview, I'm going to show you Rodan so that you uh, see how it actually looks like and the uh, uh, important components or the important concepts in Rodan. And then um, we're going to see which tools are uh, actually used within Rodan for performing each of these stages going through each of these steps. Um, so um, let's go to the overview of Rodan. Let me move to the to this page in the tutorial to getting started. This will give you uh, the websites that you can use for actually accessing Rodan. So we have a station site and a production site. This one is pretty new. So the staging site, it's good if you want to test a few things but I wouldn't suggest you to use it if you are going to actually start working on a, on a big project, because this is like um, the, the site where we're testing things, where we're uh, constantly doing development. So you shouldn't use it for something important. You should just use it for test. And you have uh, some credentials if you want to use it. They are provided in here. Um, but if you want to do a large project, uh, you should use the production site. Uh, for using that, you need to contact the DDML lab manager so that we can give you credentials. Uh, so this is the one that I'm going to use today to illustrate uh, how Rodan looks like. So let's start with that. So uh, this is how Rodan looks like. Uh, in your first time, uh, it will ask you for credentials. And if this is your first time using it, you probably won't have any projects. Uh, I have been working on it for a while, so I have a few projects here. So the first thing you would do is create a project for a, for your own purposes. So let's create a project. It's here on title. So let's double click it and give it a name. So in my case, I'm going to use this one for doing some uh, image pre-processing. So I'm going to do, I'm going to give it a name that actually represents what I am doing here. So we save it. Now you see that it has that name here, image preprocessing. If you click on it, you would see resources, workflows, workflow runs, and run jobs. So uh, I'm going to focus on the first two. Uh, so resources. Resources are files that either you're providing Rodan because you want it to process these files in some kind of way, or um, are files that are generated by Rodan. So in my case, I'm going to upload a resource. So I want this image that I have here. Uh, you can see that it has some coloring and it has some spots and I want to remove them. I want to speckle this image. So I'm going to give that image to Rodan so that I can process it in here. So it takes some time. It's, if This one didn't take too much time, but if you're actually uploading images from large manuscripts, um, well, I mean, images in higher resolution, it will take some time to load them. Uh, so don't worry too much about that. You just have to wait for it to load. You cannot um, kind of change the page, um, but you can keep on working by just opening another another tab and do other, other work here. Um, but you have to wait for the images to upload. So uh, it automatically detects the type of the image. Uh, it knows that it's a color image and a PNG. So now I want to process this image. Uh, so I move to the second part of Rodan, the workflows. Um, and I'm going to create a new workflow. Again, I'm going to give it a name. So this workflow is for pre-processing. Uh, so I save it. I can also give a description of uh, the details of the workflow. I'm going to save just the name. Uh, so workflows are basically um, 
a series of connected tasks so that uh, the whole workflow performs a particular big task that you're asking it uh, to. So for example, right now it's empty, of course, because I haven't done anything, but um, here you would uh, add jobs and each of these jobs are going to perform the particular task that you want. Uh, so uh, the jobs are the basic units of the workflow. So I'm going to add a few jobs here. Um, you, we have many jobs, as you can see here. Uh, we have a few pages of jobs. Uh, and not all of them are OMR related. A few of them are also related to music analysis, if you want to take a look. Um, and you can take a look at each of these pages just to know what is there. But if you already know uh, what's in there, you can search them by category for example, or you can search them by name. So in my case, because I have a, a, a color image, let's say that I want to convert it into black and white first. So I don't remember the exact name of the job, but I remember that it does a black and white conversion. So it's this one, convert to one bit, and this is black and white. Uh, so I add this job and it's going to, uh, maybe I didn't press, uh, it's going to appear uh, already in here. You can actually double click or click on add. And so I'm going to convert it to black and white and then I want to remove those spots. So I want to perform this speckling, this speckle, this one. So I'm going to add this job, it's there. And a really important job uh, that you always have to add is uh, this one, PNG RGB. If you hover over the job, it will tell you what it does it converts the image to PNG format. And the reason why you need this job is because um, not all images, sorry, the, 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 uh, your faces were on top of this. <laughs> not all images are PNG. Um, you might uh, upload images that are TIFF or JPEG or any other format. So what you need to do is first convert them to PNG because most of these jobs take PNG as their input. So, the ones that take an image take PNG as its input. So here we have a series of jobs, but you would see that it says here, workflow preprocessing is invalid. And why is that? Because you have like unconnected jobs. This doesn't know what the workflow really is, like what's the workflow direction. So um, just a few concepts more besides jobs. Uh, you would notice that they have these kind of uh, square boxes on top and at the, at the bottom. So if we click here, you right click on the job, you would see ports. So these are ports, you have input ports and you have output ports. So this says input port types tells you what is the usual uh, input of this job. So this job, the one that we're looking at, the black and white, it's taking a PNG image. And for the output ports, you see that what comes out of this job is a one bit or black and white PNG image. Um, so the ports give you information about what the job uh, receives as input and what um, it outputs. We can see the same information here, ports. As input, you get a one bit PNG image, so black and white image. And as an output, uh, the port type should be a one bit PNG, this speckle image. So the same image, but without all the spots. Um, so you can also have that information by hovering on top of the of the ports. So this is the PNG image. So this uh, output can actually be connected to this one. You can see that it, not, it cannot be connected to this one. You see it's not colored in green. So it's not a valid connection. It doesn't make the connection if I uh, stop um, clicking. Um, and that's because this one, the speckle, needs to receive a black and white image. And you can see one bit PNG image. So it's not available for the connection to be made, but this one does. And the same of this with this. So this um, turning of the ports into green tells you which connections are actually valid. And that helps you uh, for your whole workflow to be valid. Um, the other important concept of jobs, and not all of them have them, is the settings. Um, so if you click on settings, again, right click and you have all that information. If you click on settings, you would see um, the different settings of the job, in this case, connected component size and the description of that 
uh, of that setting. So this is the maximum number of pixels in each connected component that will be removed. So this means that if I have a bunch of black pixels that are connected within uh, to each other, if they have a maximum size of one, they would be removed. Or in this case, I'm going to put something besides one because other one, otherwise the speckle won't be noticeable. Let's put 20. So if I have a bunch of black pixels connected and these pixels are um, less than 20, then it, they, that, that spot will be removed. So let's save the settings. So you can see now, um, uh, this one doesn't have settings, for example. You can see now that all the ports are green because all of them are receiving a resource from the uh, output of another job. The only one that is still red is this one, the one at the very beginning. So um, you haven't assigned a resource to it. If you want to assign the image that I uploaded to, to this, you can double click on that and it will show you which resources are available for that particular port. And I have here the image that I want to speckle, the resource that I uploaded before. So we double click on it to add it, or uh, we can do also add all to add everything that is in here or select it and add all selected. You, you can uh, add it in many different ways. So this is the assigned resource for this job. So now that we have everything connected and all our resources are assigned to some, to some port, uh, we can do workflow run. So this will actually run the workflow. So it will run all of these jobs to perform the global task of converting your image into black and white and then removing those spots by despeckling. So let's do run. And now we have here the workflow run. It's processing. If we double click on it, we will see the individual jobs. They all finish now. So um, we can see that the status should change into finished. Um, you can see the result of this job here in the resources. This is the result. But of course, uh, this is just the last resource that it uh, generated, the, the speckled image. But for each job, it kind of generated one resource. So you can see all those resources in the resource page. And so here you have all the resources generated by this job. So uh, we have the black and white. Uh, so here is black and white. And then here we have the speckle. So you would see that it uh, lost a few of the spots, even lost a few of the smaller um, letters. So you have all that here. Um, the problem sometimes is that when you have running, you have run many, many uh, jobs, the amount of resources here will increment and it's really hard to filter them out. Of course, we have some filters. You can filter by name, uh, by the fact that you uploaded this resource or you generated with Rodan, uh, by the date you created them. So that would be like the most efficient way, but still it's not very efficient. So uh, one way to filter is by lab label. So you can assign a label to your resources. You select them and you have here labels. Uh, this is useful when you have run many, many things. Let's say the speckle 20, uh, that will be my label. So we save that label and um, it will appear uh, here eventually. <laughs> so it's it's there and then you can actually um, filter things by, by that label. I forgot to do this one, sorry. This speckle 20. Uh, so click on enter and then save. Um, but this implies that every time that you run something and you generated all the resources, you would go and then kind of add the label at the end, uh, like select all of the ones that are relevant and add the label. You can actually add the label uh, in the workflow itself. We have a, um, a job that is called labeler. I'm going to add this job. Um, name labeler. So this is just a general things to make Rodan a usable. Sorry, I didn't double click it. Um, so this is a job. And if you go to settings, you can actually give it the label. So let's say that I'm going to do a speckle uh, of a hundred. Okay. Um, so I'm going to change the settings here so that it's actually a hundred. So save. 
And um, if you see the ports of this, um, you would be able to see that, okay, uh, this is the input port type, but it has a variable number of ports. You can give it one, which is the obligatory one, or you can add up to a hundred input ports. So in my case, I want to label all these output resources that come from the different jobs. So I'm going to give it three uh, input ports. So I can click on add. I'm going to click on add two times. And you can see that now you have three input ports uh, of this input port type. And at the same time, you have now these three input ports here. So I'm going to connect each of the output ports of the other jobs to that labeler so that all of them have that label at the end. And let me give it the image. Now I have more images here, right? So if I added a label to this one, it will be easier to filter or I can filter it by name. It still has a different name. Right now I can see it there, so it's not difficult to filter it by name, image to the speckle. Uh, okay, <laughs> so double click to add and then do workflow a run. So it's processing. Uh, it's a still, uh, these jobs are still scheduling. It hasn't run them. It has finished with one, it's processing the other one. It has finished with all of them. And again, um, if we go to resources, um, you will be able to see all of the resources, but they have different labels. So it's easier to notice uh, which ones uh, were run uh, with, with the specific parameters that you're actually labeling. And the good thing about this is, the, is that, as I said, uh, you can filter things. You can filter things by name, so by the particular job, or you can filter them by labels. Sometimes the labels take a longer to upload, but here they are. So I can filter them to only see the ones that I run with the speckle of 100. So these are these three, or the ones that I run with the speckle of 20. So are these uh, other three, or see all my resources including the input image, which you can actually add a label at the moment that you upload. Uh, well, you, you add a label here and then you click on upload and the uploaded image or the uploaded resource will have that label assigned to it. So this is the general uh, overview of uh, Rodan. Um, now you know how Rodan looks like, you know about resources, about workflows, about jobs, settings and ports. So with that in mind, uh, we can actually um, look into these sections. I'm not going to go through them in detail right now, but you can actually look into these sections and they will make sense because they are written in terms of how these uh, jobs for these uh, stages of the OMR workflow are implemented in Rodan. So for example, um, in document analysis, you will find all the jobs that have to do with document analysis. You have pixel.js, which uh, Ichiro, uh, show you yesterday um, through a screenshot. Uh, you have the patchwise trainer and the last one, which is the fast pixel-wise classifier. Uh, and for each of these jobs, you will see um, the settings of the job, the input ports and the output ports. So basically you have all the information to make this job work for you in Rodan. Um, uh, what is in bold are input ports that are required, while what is in uh, italics are input ports that you can add, just like we did with the labeler that we added other input ports. The same happens with the output ports. You can add output ports. I think the yeah, the last one, the last job, has a few output ports that are also um, uh, optional. Um, so. This is the document analysis part. For symbol classification, you have the interactive classifier and also an uninteractive version, in which I'm going to show later on. Uh, for music reconstruction and encoding, you have things that have to do with pitch and with text. Let me move into that. So you have the text alignment job, which you also talked about that yesterday. Uh, these are the ports that you need for the input. You need the OCR model, the transcript of that particular um, of the text on that particular page and your text layer. And for the outputs, you will have a JSON file that we have all the information of your text alignment job. Uh, for things that have to do with pitch, you need 
the media staff finding. These are the settings, input ports and output ports. This job is just a way to kind of track the path of the staff lines. And that is useful for the next job, which is the heuristic pitch finding. That is the one that actually assigned the pitch to your individual uh, notes. Um, so don't worry, you don't need to know this by heart. Uh, this is just documentation that you can consult later on if you want to implement the workflow. And for the last part, you have the MEI encoding job. Again, you have here the settings, the ports, and NEON uh, for actually correcting the result of the MEI file. So this is just an overview. We're going to move to the actual tutorial to, um, to see how all of this looks in Rodan. So um, I'm going basically to, to give a tutorial on the end-to-end -end part. You can see here uh, other parts of uh, basically how to get certain resources that you would need, but I'm going to cover that at the end. Um, so moving to the tutorial. Um, so last time you saw this uh, Simsa workflow for new notation, and this kind of gives you a general overview of the technologies used and in which order. But how does this actually look in Rodan? It looks like uh, like this. And um, so I'm going to explain what each part does. Like you have already here some of these. Uh, jobs in the overview, but right now we're going to actually explain what they do. Um, so uh, you have first the fast pixel wise analysis of the music document. So this is the job that is in charge of getting your music document, your digitized music document, and separated into layers. So uh, it separates them into a node symbol layer, a staff line layer, and maybe a text layer. And then each of these uh, layers is uh, going through a different um, path in the workflow to be processed individually. So you have here uh, the path for the music symbol layer. Uh, you have here the path for the uh, staff line layer and the path for the text layer. Um, by the way, something that we discover later on, uh, Ichiro suggested and I tested it and it's that you don't need a text layer. You can just use a music symbol layer and a staff line layer. And then the rest of it, the background um, layer, you can put it in here. And um, the OCR model uh, that we use uh, offline is actually strong enough to kind of determine that the text, you don't need to actually uh, label them. I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, but basically, each of those layers are processing a different uh, path of this OMR workflow. So I'm going to start now with the music symbol layer here. So some of the jobs here are um, relatively, at this the beginning, they are already known by you. Uh, you have the PNG RGB as usual to convert the image into PNG, the, then the binarization of the image, so to convert it into black and white and it's speckling. The ones that are new are these three. So the CC analysis job stands for connected component analysis. So um, what this job does is that it gives you a file that contains all the glyphs to be classified. So what it does is that it takes a look at your music layer and it looks what to the pixels that are connected. So in that way, it kind of gives you, okay, this is one glyph, this is another one, and this is another one. And those are the glyphs that will be classified later on by this non-interactive classifier step. Uh, so, uh, for the non-interactive classifier step, um, what you provided is basically training data, and it will process, it will classify all those glyphs for you. It will tell you whether they are clefs or a particular node, a particular rest, and so on. But, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, how to get this training data, because it's one of the things that you have to provide in these ports. I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, right now, we're just seeing the whole picture of the end-to-end -end, uh, workflow. Um, but I'm going to talk about the resources here that you need uh, and how you would get them uh, at the very uh, end. So in this step, um, you see that the music symbols are processed by all these jobs. And there is this additional diagonal num slicing job between the connected components and the classifier. So this is particularly useful for square notation. Uh, you probably won't use it for uh, anti-astomatic NUMS, but in screen notation is very useful because 
you know that there are many uh, categories of NUMS. And then getting the training data for a classifier to learn all those categories is very time consuming because you have to give training data for each of those categories, um, for each of those classes. So this job is actually reducing the number of classes that you would need. This job is slicing the NUMS diagonally, all the ones that it can. Like for example, this torculus, if we split it diagonally, we will have like three components, all of them looking the same, all of them being a square a node, a, a punctum. Uh, here we will have three, we will have this one. So we will have just two categories, this one and this uh, kind of rhomboic shape. So instead of having multiple categories for all the norms that we have, we will have just like probably uh, six categories for the different symbols that will appear because uh, all of them are made of either square shapes or, di or rhomboic shapes or these kind of oblique shapes. Uh, so this is really useful for a square notation. I don't think it would be that useful for adiastomatic because uh, because you cannot split it diagonally. And in that case, of course, you would have to uh, give it more training data to have all these different classes of NUMS. But for square notation, uh, this job is actually very useful. So we add it so that we uh, reduce the number of classes. So we reduce the training data that we have to prepare. Um, so this is the first part, the music symbol layer uh, processing. Now we move into the staff line layer processing. So the very beginning is pretty similar to how we process the music symbol layer. The um, uh, important step here that is different is the Miyao stuff finding. So Miyao stuff finding, as I said before, what it does is that it basically uh, tracks the path of your staff lines. So if you have that together with your uh, NUM components with your symbols here, uh, and you put that together, then you can find the pitch because you would see where those NUM components lie in your um, in your stuff and you can find the pitch. Um, so now what we have here is basically a NUM components with pitch. And for the last job, the text alignment. So this is processing the text layer or the background layer that already includes the text. And here uh, you provide an OCR model and you provide the um, the transcript, the text of that page that you are processing, and um, it will align them with, uh, with the results of the OCR. And taking this, the text, and the NUM components with their pitch, you can go into the MEI encoding job. Um, so this is a job that will give you uh, the MEI file encoding, all these uh, NUMs with pitches and with the text. So what it does, um, I don't know how many of you were in the MEI workshop, but the MEI encoding of a syllable, let's say, would look like this. Uh, so this is, um, this syllable contains this particular text here, and it contains two NUMs, this one and this one, this NUM, which is a clevis, and this NUM, which is a podatus, and it will tell you a, the individual components of that NUM. So how do we get from these two jobs, the heuristic pitch finding and the text alignment to the MEI encoding? So this job, the MEI encoding, what it's doing is, okay, from the heuristic pitch finding, you have the pitch and the NUM components of, uh, of any symbols. So you probably have already this NUM component with this particular pitch, this one, this one, and this one these four. And then what it does is, okay, based on the proximity of those NUM components, it groups them into NUMs. So because these two are close together in the image, this should be one NUM probably, and the same with these two. And it groups them into another NUM. And then it looks at the bounding boxes of the, uh, that uh, were detected in the text alignment job, uh, because the OCR kind of detected where uh, the bounding boxes of the text were. So it looks at the bounding box for the for this syllable, and it says, okay, it takes probably the space of those two nums. So I'm going to group all of that, that particular syllable, and those two nums in this syllable element. So that's the way that it is doing this. Um, 
it also requires an input port, especially if you are dealing with a diastematic notation that does a, a, um, the mapping of a, these classes that you provided to an interactive classifier, um, the mapping of those classes to the particular encoding of that num. So um, finally, we reach the neon job, which is where you do the corrections of your results. Um, by the way, all of the jobs that are interactive have their own instructions. Um, if you go to the section uh, in the overview that talks about the job, you will always find a link to uh, the wiki of that job that has instructions on how to use it. So for example, uh, here's where Neon is introduced and you will have a link to the instruction page on the wiki. And here you would see all that you need to know to actually use Neon. Um, so it has a, a quick start that will guide you on how to use a Neon and all the functionalities. And that's the case for all interactive jobs for Pixel and for the interactive classifier. Uh, you will always have in the original documentation, as soon as that job appears, it will give you a link to the actual instructions on how to use them. Uh, so right now, um, okay, you know how all this structure uh, looks like and in general how it works, but let's see it actually working. Uh, let's run this workflow. So uh, going back to Rodan, I have already a project here. Uh, for this project, I already have a few resources that I uploaded beforehand. Um, so I uploaded a few images just for images from the uh, Salsin Santifonal. I uploaded a few uh, transcript texts for the part, for each of these images uh, and a bunch of other um, resources that I'm going to talk later on and explain how to get them. But basically these are the resources that you need uh, to add in each of these ports so that you can actually run the workflow. Um, and there's information about it, uh, about how to get them uh, in the documentation. So uh, it is actually in uh, at the very beginning in the homepage, you can see digital resources. So it will tell you all the resources that you need to run that workflow and how to get them. And I'm going to go to this part at the very end. So uh, we're going to see it. Um, so these are the resources I have already uploaded them just so that I can run the workflow. And uh, here I have my workflow. Um, so uh, what do you need to run this? Uh, of course, at the very beginning, you need an image. So I have four images. I'm going to process this one, the nine recto. Um, of course, if you're given a, a nine, a, a, the, that particular image here, you have to give that exact text in the text alignment job. So this is your model. This is the transcript. Oops. So I have to give the transcript for nine recto two because that's the image I am providing. And then what else? Uh, so that's the only part that will change from run to run, depending on which image you want to process. All the other uh, ports, uh, you will fill it basically the same, um, regardless of which run you are doing, which workflow run. So here I have to put all the models um, that have been trained to segment the document into, into different layers. So uh, I have uploaded these models already. Again, I'm going to show you how to generate this uh, later on. Background model. And you will see that it's only showing me uh, three resources, which are the only models that I have uploaded. It's not showing me everything else like the images are. It's only showing me the resources that are actually valid as an input in this port. Uh, model one is this one. Just let me double check that I entered the correct models. Model zero, model zero. Background model, background model. And by the way, it this the name of this resource because I obtained it in Rodam. I just uploaded it in a different place. You can see in the name the actual job that I use for getting this particular resource. So I use the Patchwise Analysis of Music document, which is actually documented in the page that I showed you before. 
So I have the models that will actually segment um, the document into different layers. And then the output of this would be the actual segmentation of that particular image that I gave. So here the music symbol layer comes and I have to provide here training data that I generated with camera uh, with the interactive classifier that I'm going to talk about later on. So I'm providing the training data and I am also providing this feature selection. And um, for the text alignment, I have to provide an OCR model as well. This OCR model generated offline. If this is sounding like where she's getting these resources, again, uh, I don't want you to worry about that uh, right now. Right now we're going to run just the end-to-end -end and we are going to talk about how to get them uh, afterwards. And now we need the MEI mapping CSV. So this is generated by the um, MEI mapping tool that I'm going to show later uh, that has the mapping of the classes that you have in the classifier to the actual MEI encoding. So we have all of the resources assigned. We can run the workflow. So the workflow is processing. Of course, now we have more jobs in this one workflow. So uh, they will take some time to generate. The one job that takes the most time, uh, it's, uh, where is it? It's the one that has the fast in the name. <laughs> um, this fast pixel wise analysis of music document. Um, because there is this lower version of it. Uh, this one takes four minutes uh, and that's the one that takes longer. So uh, while we wait for this to finish, uh, I am actually going to show you how in general, uh, how to get uh, these resources that you need to run your workflow. So as I said, um, there is a, in the documentation a section on that. Um, and also, um, let me put this at one side. Um, and also in digital resources, um, sorry, in hints, you can also see this diagram that tells you what are the expected resources to be uh, in this whole uh, workflow. So uh, here, you have this diagram, it's in the documentation, so you don't have to memorize how to connect all these things. And actually, uh, the connection of the individual jobs for each for each part of, uh, of the workflow uh, are given to you in the, in the OMR tutorial in each section. So this section tells you, okay, what to run before the interactive classifier. Uh, and then it talks to you about the non-interactive version of it, which is the one that we're using. Uh, also for this, uh, Mijao stuff finding what jobs to precede, that precede that particular job, and then how to connect uh, that with heuristic pitch finding. All this is uh, the tutorial is taking you uh, step by step, uh, so that you can actually create this whole workflow here. And in the hint section, it's telling you other things that you need to know, like uh, tricks, uh, tips and tricks for uh, Rodan. And it gives you the uh, overview of the whole workflow with the resources that you need. And again, the explanation of how to get these resources is in the digital resource page. So I'm going to close uh, what I have uh, here. Okay. So how do you get all of this? So let's start with the um, let's start with this blue box with what you need for the text alignment. So for the text alignment, uh, which is this last one, uh, let me try to show part of the diagram with this at the same time. So for the text alignment, you need two things, the plain text transcript of the num text or the lyrics um, um, and the OCR model. Uh, so for the OCR model, uh, you can read this section here and the text alignment job in the GitHub repository, it will tell you how to train a new OCR model uh, with Okrapu. So you basically done this uh, training, you, you develop this OCR model offline and then you give it to Rodan when you want to use it for processing your uh, particular image. 
And uh, for the other thing, for the transcript, um, you can consult this section here in the tutorial. It tells you how to get uh, the text from the Cantus um, database. So uh, here it tells you, okay, look for that particular manuscript that you want to work on, and then export this CSV uh, file. And in that CSV file, you will have uh, rows that indicate um, all the all the folios. And in the columns, look for this full text manuscript column, and then look for the rows that have to do with your folio, and then just copy that. And you will paste that into a text file, and that's it. So I am talking it very quickly, but all is in this CSV export uh, file. Uh, in this column full text manuscript, you can find it, the text for the for the full manuscript and you can go to the individual rows to see the text for for the folio that you're looking into. So you basically just copy that, uh, put it into a text file and that's it. That's what you need to provide here. Um, you probably would like also to um, here it says often the last chant from the previous folio will continue onto this page. So you will probably want to copy that row too. Um, the text alignment job will discard any text not found in the page. So you can copy that row and if the text is not found in the page, that's fine. It won't, it won't try to look for it. Uh, so that's this part. Just wanted to see how this is going. Oh, okay. So this, this is almost done, the workflow that we run. Um, now you see that it's not completely finished if I look for the workflow run. I would see that it says processing still, but it is waiting for inputting NEON because NEON is one of the interactive jobs. So I'm going to pause on the explanation on how to get these resources just so that I can open NEON. So NEON is uh, waiting for your input to correct the MEI file. So I'm going to open NEON and actually while NEON loads, I'm going to continue with this explanation. So this is how you get your resources for your text alignment job. For the CSV uh, mapping, what you would do is that you would use this uh, uh, new mapping tool uh, where you basically give the class and the MEI is, is code snippet for that particular class. So it can, does, it can do the mapping of the new components that have been detected by the classifier and have been classified with these classes and convert those into the actual MEI uh, encoding. You can provide images and more things so that um, so that this makes um, sense. You you know this is a class and this is how it should be mapped into MEI, but you also know how it looks like and where you can find it. Um, so this is for the num MEI mapping tool. Um, let me check how Neon is doing. I don't okay. Um, so I'm going to just finish the end-to-end -end part um, and then going back into how to get the resources that you need. Um, so this is Neon. Uh, this is the interface that you would use to correct what was recognized by the um, OMR workflow to correct your uh, result in MEI file. Uh, as I said, in the wiki of Neon, you can see how to use it. Um, I'm going to show a few of the functionalities. So we can zoom in using this uh, bar or at the same time, you can zoom in by uh, doing shift and scroll in or scroll out. You can move through the image by clicking and doing shift and then moving around. Um, we can also, I don't know if you see them right now, but uh, there is a MEI being rendered on top of the image. Uh, I can reduce the image opacity so that you can see just the MEI, or I can reduce the glyph opacity so that you can look to the actual image. Um, to facilitate uh, visualization and correction, we also have some highlighting options. So we have a highlight by staff. So you would see all the NUMS uh, that it judges as uh, being part of a particular staff. You can highlight by syllable. And this is particularly useful if you also use the display text bounding boxes. So if we display those, you would see, okay, all of these belong to this syllable, 
all of these to this syllable, all of these to this syllable, and so on. We can actually display the text. And I can move into the text here. You would see I'm going to move through the text and things will get highlighted in the image. So I'm right now in Rex. Noster adveni. Sorry if I am pronouncing bad. <laughs> but uh, as you move into the text, you will see how nums and syllables get highlighted. So this uh, also facilitates to a uh, visualization and then correction. And you can display the info of the particular num. So if you hover over a num, let's say I hover over this one, you can see in that panel in the right, it says shape, colors, and pitches A2, C3, A2 based on the cleft that it has. So um, all of that information is shown uh, here for you. Now let's say, of course, I want to edit this because uh, this is a interface for correction. So you click on edit MEI and let's do a few corrections here. Let's, I have already annotated a few of them <laughs> so that this is a little bit more guided. Um, so let's see this, but it's here. So this is one syllable, but at the same time, if I do highlight by nums, this should be two separate nums, but if I do highlight by nums, you could see that they are in the same color, these two. It thinks that it's one, one num. So if you want to separate this into two nums, you click on it, go to the edit panel, you do num, sorry, uh, you do num first, then click on it, and then do ungroup. So now it thinks that each of these colors, each of these components are actually nums. So I do num component and I try to group those num components into one num. Uh, so all these four are actually one num, so I will group them. I will group these num components to form one num. Now they are all in the same color because I'm highlighting by num. Now they are all in the same color, so they are just one num. For this one, this note moved around, so I'm going to put it in the right place. Then I'm going, by the way, you can actually move things. <laughs> I'm going to show that at the end. You can group all these num components so that they are one num. Now it's in one color, so it's one num. Still the shape, it's weird. So I will select this component, and this component, and do toggle ligature. And you will see that that those two uh, num components are going to change the shape into an oblique uh, kind of figure like this. Uh, so now I have two nums here because I'm highlighting by nums and these two have different colors. But if I do highlight by syllable, I will see that even though they are two nums, they still belong to the same syllable. They belong to this syllable. Um, another thing that we can do, uh, let's see. Uh, Jerusalem here, I'm missing one symbol. So I can actually insert things. I can actually insert or remove things. So I'm going to insert uh, this in here because it's missing. Of course, I'm going to uh, undo this. Of course, as soon as I insert them, you would see that right now there's just one blue syllable with all of these nums. When I insert it, it will generate another syllable just for that particular thing that I entered. So as soon as I click on there, I have a new syllable here. So that's not correct. So let's edit that. Let's do syllable in here in the edit panel, select all what is there and say merge syllables. So when I do that, all of these will be in one color and I will lose this box that is here. So I do the selection, merge syllables, and now this is correct. Okay, so those are a few of the functionalities. As I said, besides adding things, you can actually delete things. So you just select, like I selected this customs and click delete on your, um, the, your delete a key on your keyboard. That's, that's it. Also, when I undid something, I uh, basically did control C just like the usual uh, shortcuts that you would use on your keyboard to do these things. And uh, now let's see, the other thing that you can do is change the um, head of the note. So this one, sorry, I need to select my new component. So uh, this one over here, it's obviously wrong. Um, we can actually reduce the glyph opacity to see that, this note. So it has a square a kind of shape. It should be, if we reduce the opacity, it should be a rhomboid kind of shape. So we're going to change that by clicking on it and do head shapes. 
and we can change it to a Virgo, for example, or uh, to an inclinatum to have the right shape. Uh, and then let's do just one more thing. Um, so this thing, for example, this all this is supposed to be one syllable because I'm highlighting by syllable, it's in the same color, but that's not true. Uh, it's actually missing this uh, ru, uh, syllable in Jerusalem. So what we do is that uh, we have to ungroup the syllable. So we select the syllable and we do ungroup. And now uh, this one has its own boundary box, which is here, it's little, but it's there. Uh, and you will see that uh, if I move here, if I select that, this doesn't have any text. You can actually add the text by clicking on the on the diamond shape. The diamond shape indicates that there is no text there. You can click on that and write the syllable that is supposed to be there. Click OK. Now, if I do, where is it? This one. If I move into this syllable, you would see that it's highlighted in the image, right? And of course, the bounding box is not quite right. So you do edit by bounding box, select the bounding box, and you can actually move the bounding box around or change its shape. Um, another good thing about this is that you can um, move th things around. So for example, I can move a whole syllable like this syllable that is, comp uh, comp uh, that is made of these two nums. You can move the whole syllable <laughs> The whole num is uh, belonging to that syllable, or you can use num and just move one num of those two, or you can even use num component and just move one of the components of that syllable. Um, so this is neon. Uh, I wanted to spend some time in in here because it's a one of the interactive jobs that we have and uh, the one that it, you would use to correct the result of your whole workflow. So when you are fine with uh, all the corrections, you click on validate, and that will send the MEI file back to Rodan. Uh, and it will check, it's always checking that your MEI file is valid so that it conforms with the rules of the music encoding initiative about how to encode NUMS. So you click on validate and the file is sent back to Rodan and it will eventually finish the workflow, okay? Uh, so uh, going back uh, to how to get these resources. So now it's fine, you know how to run this workflow, but you need to add these resources. We have talked about the resources for text alignment. We have talked about the resources for the MEI encoding job. There are other two jobs that we need to talk about. So how do you get the models for the uh, document analysis? So for segmenting the document into these layers. So you get them through using two types of jobs. One is pixel, pixel.js, also an interactive job. And because it's an interactive job, you have a wiki that has documentation about it. So you can consult this wiki and see how things are done in pixel. Again, the link to this is in the actual uh, documentation uh, page. So let's look on how to use pixel. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm going to look for certain sections right now. Um, here is telling you how to remove pixels from one layer, how to add them. So just basically what you're doing is kind of coloring on top of the image to say these pixels belong, for example, these pink ones to the glyph layer, the yellow ones to the staff line layers, the blue ones to the text layer. As I said, right now you don't need a text layer anymore. Um, and again, I'm going to mention this briefly in a few seconds. Uh, and you can do a, a lot of things. You have rectangles to draw the, to, uh, draw the, pix the, sorry, the pixels for the notes. You can uh, have brushes to, um, to go and do some more complicated things, uh, erase. Uh, you even have functionality to, if you want some assistance in doing straight lines and so on. Um, so um, in Pixel, um, you can have as output the layers that you, uh, that you basically uh, classify or label using this job. So normally you would have a music symbol layer because we're doing OMR, so it's for music. You would have a staff line layer if there are staff lines and the background layer is generated by default by pixel. 
So the good thing is that the background layer includes everything that is not in the other layers. So that includes the text. And again, because the OCR model, uh, it's uh, this OCR model from a corpus is good enough to detect the text in that background layer because there are no other symbols than the text. You have already moved the music symbols and the staff lines. So it will be good enough to detect the text from that background layer. So you don't need to actually uh, label the pixels for the text because to be honest, those are the harder to <laughs> label. They don't have like rectangular shapes. They are, they have like irregular shapes. You need to use the brush and it's a little bit more complicated. Now you cannot do it. You can just do this music symbol, the stuff lines and leave pixel to get the background layer, which will include the text. Um, this is some notes on how to use them. All these notes are actually the documentation. So I'm not going to focus on that. And then when you want to actually train your models, you can use one of these two trainers. We have two options, a, a pixel wise trainer and a patch wise trainer. Uh, this were uh, mentioned yesterday by Chiro. Uh, this was referred to as CNN and this one as SAE, which are the technologies that are behind those uh, those um, training uh, those training tools. So the important thing is that each of them, uh, the output models of each of them are used as input to different jobs. This one is the pixel wise document analysis job and this is the fast pixel wise document analysis job, which is the one that we use in the, in the demo. So um, you can use any of these and, and go back to pixel and retrain things. And the idea is, okay, I can use pixel to just label a, a small section of an image and I have the layers for that. And I can use this first, this pixel wise trainer to label the rest of the pixels in the image. Because this one takes, it has an advantage over the second one in, in the sense that it has in its way less training data to get a, a good model. The problem is that the classifying job associated to it is very slow. It's the one that it was saying that took like six hours to classify a page. So it wouldn't be good to use it for classifying your whole manuscript. It's better to use this one that takes just four minutes. So um, because of that, you can use this one just to kind of help you to get a few pages classified. And when you have around three to five pages, then you can train uh, this second one uh, that will be useful for the rest of your manuscript and will take some like just minutes per page. Um, that's a general overview uh, of these ones. And finally, um, for the non-interactive classifier, you need training data. And the training data comes from the interactive classifier. And it was also included in each presentation last time. And again, because it's interactive, it has its own uh, documentation in the wiki, in its wiki. And this video is really good if you want to use this for the first time. It's, it has all the information about all the uh, user interface and um, what kind of a, uh, and for the buttons, it tells you when to use, for example, a um, submit corrections and reclassify. I want to do group glyphs and reclassify. So it's a bunch of information about this particular job uh, in a small video of 10 minutes is really good. Uh, but you that's the job that you have to use um, to get the training data that will go into this non-interactive one. And the non-interactive one, you need it because uh, you won't interact with it, so it won't wait for you to keep anything. You provide the training data from the beginning, and that's the one that you need to use for processing multiple pages of your manuscript. And that's the last part that I want to talk about. What if you don't want to process just one page, but multiple pages? That is actually in the documentation. It's here. Uh, and I have already uh, something prepared for that. So this is the workflow you saw the last time. I have already filled all the resources in except the one for the image and the one for the text alignment. So if I want to process multiple image, what I have to do is uh, just let me uh, filter this out because now we have a lot of images. I just want the ones from the manuscript. So I want these four, uh, but I have to guarantee that um, these images are processing with the right text. So I want them to, I want to present them to Rodan in the same order. 
So we can order them by name and add all of this here. And then I need to add the transcript for those ones, which are these four. Um, and guarantee that they are ordered in the, that they are presented in the same order um, than the images. And that's it. And then you click on run and it will process the whole manuscript for you. Um, by the way, I don't know if you noticed, but there is one job that is missing in there. It's Neon. Because right now, uh, Neon can actually be used for multiple pages at the same time. But the version of Neon that is in Rodan is working just for one page right now. We are going to um, also implement that functionality of multiple pages here. But for now, you have to remove Neon. And all that is written in the documentation. So um, even though this was very fast, this is a general overview of uh, how you would use uh, this end-to-end -end OMR workflow in Rodan, how it looks like, what resources that does it need, and how to process multiple folios. Um, so I hope uh, you liked it and that eventually you test it. And as I said, everything is in the documentation, but if for some reason you see you are testing it and, um, and you see that something is missing or is not clear, please let us know. Uh, we will be happy to, to solve that for you. So thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Martha, very much. Uh, I will definitely be requesting, you know, user credentials uh, later. And but for now, we have uh, space for some questions. Uh, like yesterday, please uh, either raise your hand uh, or write your question in the chat, and I will do my best to ensure that uh, no questions are forgotten. Please. Uh, so there's a question in chat from Cynthia Pires. Uh, how do you add accidentals uh, in Rodan or I suppose more accurately in Neon? Uh, there was an unrecognized flat in, on the page. Okay, perfect. Uh, Thanks, Cynthia. Uh, so uh, if you want the accidentals to be detected, you have to actually have them as streaming data of your symbol classifier. Sometimes they get lost also because um, when you did the speckling and this kind of things, because they are so faint compared to the rest of the nodes, they get lost. Uh, but if you uh, have them in the symbol, recog in the symbol recognition part um, and they are not that faint, they should be detected. As far as if you can add them at the end in neon, that's true that I didn't saw something for accidentals, but I'm pretty sure they should be there. So I can I can check if you give me a few seconds. Um, because I will have to run the workflow again. I'm pretty sure that there, because I only show how to add nodes, but there were also things about how to add node groupings and other things. So probably accidentals are there because at least I know that Custos is there. So probably accidentals too, but I will check and get back to you. <laughs> All right. Other questions? Uh, I actually have one. Uh, so what are the reasonable minimal computational resources for deploying Rodan? How much hardware do you need to dedicate to it? To be honest, I don't know the details for, for that. I can figure them out for you. Like a, um, I can talk to the developer, to the main developer of Rodan to figure that out. But I am more like in the user testing side of right. Rodan. Um, and on a related note, uh, what is uh, the project's policy on uh, sharing the training data and the training models? Um, some models uh, for a previous uh, 
for a previous set of images from the cell scenes are actually in one of the GitHub repositories. And um, because we haven't finished, uh, we have this project, uh, we have funding for this project until the end of summer. So we are still like fine tuning things. But at the end of that, I think we are going to share the models. Like I have already some models ready and for testing them, I think we, we should share them so that they have some resources to start working on. So I will share those in the documentation uh, later on. Um, and also, um, I didn't show that, but um, you can actually, if you have a workflow already made, you can actually export that workflow mm -hmm. and you can pass it to someone else and that person can actually import the workflow. There are buttons for that. So I'm going to share the workflow that I had with the settings that are already there. I'm going to put that in one of the pages of the documentation so that people can just upload the workflow too. Yeah, so the I, policies are, we're going to share them. We're just not there yet. <laughs> yeah, th this is going to be an amazing resource going forward, definitely. I mean, I'm thinking about stuff like, uh, can we deploy uh, Rodan perhaps on one of the national or European uh, computational support uh, uh, centers? Like various clusters that support research. We have, uh, I think, what is it? Uh, Metacentrum in the Czech Republic, and there are many others on the continent. This is where my questions are pointing. <laughs> Easy. All right, uh, other questions? Besides, you know, can I get my user credentials now? If you're right to that uh, URL, yes, we, we will give you some credentials, yes. <laughs> For now, you can test it in, in, in the staging, in the staging uh, um, uh, mm -hmm. site. Um, sorry, I was seeing the chat. You can uh, check it in the staging site. Um, it has the default credentials for the guest account. Mm -hmm. But yes, again, uh, it's just for testing you. I wouldn't suggest to actually, if you're going to do something in a big project to put it there because every now and then, because it's for testing, it gets wiped. So it, yeah. it won't be a good idea. Or if you're running something small, that's yeah. fine. And you can download always the resources to your computer. So for that, it's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, one more thing comes up. Uh, how does uh, the text alignment uh, module deal with text that is not aligned to any music, like rubrics or rubrics. other writings? Yes, yeah, so right now what it does is that, um, so it takes uh, two inputs, the, OC, the results of, uh, it takes the OCR model and it takes mm -hmm. The transcript getting from gotten from um, the Cantus database. So the thing is that it tries to align only the text from the Cantus database, which doesn't include rubrics. Mm -hmm. It tries to align that to the uh, uh, not so good text detected by the OCR. Mm -hmm. So when it tries to do that, it never gets. It kind of gets reads of the rubrics because the rubrics are not mapped to anything. Uh, in the Cantus uh, database text. So that's how right. those things are, are yeah. removed. Mm -hmm. cool. And if you want them, you would have to add them into the transcript, I suppose. Yes, exactly. Exactly. But yeah. uh, I think that maybe we have some issues, like it's looking at things sequentially. Mm -hmm. So because that text is, sometimes you have the, the let's say the lyrics, the num text here and you have the rubrics here and it has like a bunch of things. So mm. it will, depends on how the OCR detects it and how you actually put it in the text mm -hmm. to actually be able to map things in order. Right, yeah. And actually, can you like retrain also Ocropus to adapt? Because you, you can retrain uh, all the o OMR models, right? You, yes. Using interactive data, can you also uh, iteratively uh, improve uh, our purpose for the specific, let's say, handwriting that you have? Mm, not sure. Uh, I haven't like focused on that part of the workflow. I mostly focus on the part of a sec document segmentation. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim De Roos is the one that focused on that. Um, probably it's in the documentation in the wiki. Mm -hmm. um, like I don't have an answer right away, but I'm pretty sure it should be in the wiki. And 
I think not. I think that you can just train it with that and that's it. Um, let me check for text. Text alignment. Uh, that's in digital resources. So 40 OCR uh, section. Uh, I will check uh, this this part uh, to see if a corpus can be kind of a uh, retrained and improved. Um, but I think I think it's not. But I will have to to read it and and test it a little bit to know. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So thanks a lot. This was super informative. Uh, I was really looking Thank forward you. to when Simsa puts in you know, all the pieces, uh, all the pieces that were there. And I'm looking forward to playing around with this. Perfect, perfect. That's, that, that's the ideal thing. <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions that come, that come up? Raise your hand, use the chat. I'm trying to run Neon again, uh, just to answer, uh, answer Cynthia's question. Otherwise I will write to you, Cynthia. Um, Okay, so thank you all for participating. Again, this goes on YouTube, so you can refer back to it. And uh, Martha, can I send out your email so that people can? Yes, uh, yes, of up? course. Okay. We'll yes, that. of course. It was in the last slide, but I probably stopped sharing very quickly. But yes, of mm -hmm. course. Yeah. Okay. So this was the second session of, of the first uh, first digital humanities workshop of the year. Again, I'm very sure there in a live event we would have a lot of very loud applause right now. But uh, we have to make do with imagining. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. And yeah, I, I like sharing this with everyone. So thank you very much. And we'll see you all tomorrow. See you tomorrow. And uh, if I may say, if you want, I, I hope that I um, I am not intervening, Jan, to your plans. But I think after tomorrow's workshop, if you want to stay around for a chat, just to grab a coffee so that we can just reflect on all three days or share other news, uh, please just uh, do plan it in forward so that there will be space just uh, for a small chat. Yes, we have more time allocated for tomorrow's session, partly in order to accommodate some discussion. Also tomorrow you will see uh, a tools from a different project that aim towards the same goal, but kind of in a, in ways that are in some kind, in some ways different. Uh, so we are definitely looking forward to your insights, to perhaps your feature requests, uh, and in general, to also hearing about uh, your needs, because tools are getting presented here that might match what you need, but maybe you need something slightly different. So this is a chance to directly ask the developers of these tools. Uh, to maybe include uh, some of your uh, specific needs in their plans. Okay. That's a bonus you get for participating live. The people who watch this on YouTube don't have a chance to do that. Okay, with that in mind, uh, again, looking forward to your participation tomorrow, if you indeed plan to come. And thanks for today. Thanks especially to Martha and have a great evening or day. Thanks, bye.